Good morning. So we've been in a conversation. We have had one week of talking points. And, um, you know, it's my contention that uh, the local church should be the safest place on the planet to talk about anything, including politics. And so last week we launched into this collection of talks designed to make us uh, better, uh, but also designed to make us a good bit uh, uncomfortable and perhaps even nervous. It's almost impossible to avoid the topic of politics these days. And so uh, since this is true, and by the way, in case you don't remember or didn't, aren't looking at the calendar, we've got nine days, nine days until election day. <clears throat> So we might as well talk about it since we can't avoid it anyway. And uh, hopefully during these conversations that we'll have uh, this week and next week still, uh, we'll get better at navigating the tensions that inevitably uh, rise up around this subject this time of the year. So this morning I want to talk to you about choices. You choose you choose. This morning, I want to talk to you about how you choose. So as we choose, we ought to be wrestling with the question, are we, um, are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? In other words, are we willing to consider that Jesus calls us to live a certain way and we put that ahead of, as followers of Jesus, we put that ahead of our political preferences? Ahead of uh, politics that say I am a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I am independent. Are we willing to do this? We asked this question last week. It bears repeating. Are we willing to do this even if this puts it at odds with our party and our candidate? Now, don't hear me say that you shouldn't have a political opinion. You should have a political opinion. You might even have a party that you adhere to. But what I am suggesting is that, uh, that as Jesus commanded us, uh, this idea of living undivided. Last week we prayed, make us one so we can influence many. Make us one so we can influence many. You know that if we are united, the influence we carry is exponentially higher than if we are divided. So we can disagree politically, but we must love unconditionally. And in the process, you and I are called to pray for unity. In the first century, uh, people were already, always trying to get Jesus to choose sides. The same is true today. Both parties are convinced Jesus would support their policies and their politics. Republicans believe this because of their values. And if you ask someone who votes Democrat on the Democrat side, they would say, absolutely, Jesus is on our side because of our care and concern for society's well-being. Dr. Tony Evans famously says, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. And that's true. He came to take over. He came to introduce the kingdom of God, this upside down kingdom that says the last will be first and the first will be last. A kingdom that is always at some level at odds with political parties and with the empires of this world. And since this is true, how foolish is it that the local church can be divided over temporary political differences? So today, I want to help us with a template of sorts to steer us in the direction of both choosing rightly, of getting clarity, and about how uh, we are going to make decisions. So choosing rightly and how we will make decisions. But first of all, it's important for us to recognize that agreement on all the issues before us does not necessarily indicate an atmosphere of unity. In fact, sometimes that simply means we have a perception of unity, but in reality, there's this capitulation to popular opinion, or, or probably worse, we find ourselves in an echo chamber that doesn't allow for independent, faith-informed thought. John Tyson, author and pastor, says, I care less and less about people's opinions on cultural issues and more and more about the quality of their embodied response to those issues. How you live is what you believe. Everything else is just talk. How you live is what you believe. Everything else is just talk. Because 
You and I know that despite our best attempt at curating what the world around us sees of us, knows of us, what is actually true is that our action or our inaction on their behalf speaks louder than any claims we can make about good intentions. Actions always speak, mama told us that, right? Actions always speak louder than words. So given this, we now have to ask, what's going to inform my decision making? What's going to inform my decision making? As a Christian, will it be my faith or will it be my politics? What is the filter through which my thought process rolls? As a follower of Jesus, are my decisions representing the ethic that the Apostle Paul introduces in this uh, helpful phrase, the law of Christ? The law of Christ. With this introduction, Paul, who was a Roman citizen, he was a scholar, he was a, a brilliant writer, he wrote much of the New Testament, he brings, this, uh, brings up this phrase, and it points back to that night when Jesus was gathered with his disciples for the final Passover meal prior to his, just prior to his crucifixion. If you remember that story, uh, Jesus is sitting there with his disciples, and he looks at them and he says, hey guys, I'm going to give you a new command. There's a new command. You know you had 613. You had 613 commands, you had the Torah, but I'm giving you a new command because we're establishing a new covenant. A new covenant requires a new command and no longer the, the old way of doing things, this retributive action like the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But instead, I'm calling you to sacrificial actions. I'm calling you to a higher standard, a standard that says I will love my enemy. I will love those who despitefully use me. I will love those who disagree with me on all matter of things, especially politically. We are going to love one another just as I have loved you. Paul confirms this in his letters to the church. The law of Christ is the uniting ethic for all followers of Jesus. It's the big idea. It's this new kingdom standard, the ethic that, 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 that gives us our marching orders as followers of Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. Last week, we, we studied this a bit in John chapter 13. So now I'm giving you a new commandment, he says. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world, here it is, that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world around you that you are my disciples. To the church in Corinth, Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, even though I'm a free man... With no master, I have become a slave to all pre people to bring many to Christ. Paul's saying, I have spiritual freedom. I am free in all things, but I am in bondage to people, to all people. I am living, I'm choosing to live selflessly, keeping my eyes on not just what is good for me, but ultimately what it will introduce the world to Jesus, what is good for others as well. Love as I have loved. 1 Corinthians 9, 21, when I am with the Gentiles, he writes, who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so that I can bring them to Christ. But here's the kicker. I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ, to which a Jewish reader might have said, wait a minute, you just said you're not under the law. You're not going to act like somebody under the law, but you're not out from under the law? What are you talking about? So you've pulled away from the Torah, but how, somehow you're still under the I'm confused. How are you still under the law? To which he would have said, but I am still under the authority of God, but not the Torah. It's something else. It is now that I'm under the law of Christ, which says, love one another as I have loved you. In Galatians 6, Paul again writes, share each other's burdens, and in this way, here it is, obey the law of Christ. When the concerns of others concern you and you act, you are fulfilling the law of Christ. See, this isn't rocket science. It is just so difficult, though, for us 
to remove our own agenda long enough to see the people around us and be concerned with what concerns them. As Jesus followers of all political persuasions, the law of Christ should inform our collective conscience. Look, all of us should be disturbed. All of us should be irritated. All of us should be convicted by the same things. When you see an injustice done, you ought to be disturbed. When you see people making decisions that are going to ruin their life and their family's life, you should be irritated. You should be convicted about stepping in and offering assistance. We should be disturbed when people are disrespected, when we see someone being disrespected. That should, that should disturb us greatly. According to Jesus, what's good for people is what's good, and what's best for people is best. So the law of Christ should inform our collective conscience. So we're putting it together, the law of Christ plus an informed conscience. For example, uh, when we talk about an informed conscience, uh, once upon a time, it was self-evident. It was obvious. No one would ask any questions about this because, well, it was just the way things had always been done. Aristotle said, some people should be owned by other people for their own good. The full quote is, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection and others for rule. Aristotle saying, hey, in the fourth century AD, slavery is a thing. But then St. Augustine comes along. He was a Christian bishop, and he began to have a conscience about this. And he says, slavery is the result of sin. But he was a voice crying out in the, in the darkness, seemingly, in that era. But Christians began picking up on this message, and they began having misgivings and began to see the discrepancy between what the scriptures say about human beings being created in the image of God and the horror of slavery. In another example, at one time, at one time it was self-evident, it was obvious, no one questioned it. That infanticide, or in the Roman world, it was called exposure, was good for society. This meant the disposing of babies was fully accepted. If you had a little girl, and you had, didn't have a little boy yet, and you didn't want that little girl, it was fully acceptable for you to set that little baby down by the river or at the edge of the forest or outside the city wall. This was called infanticide or exposure in that era of time. Legally, you were not culpable for allowing your child to die because the fates, those three goddesses of Greek mythology, they were credited with deciding the fate of that child. So blame the fates and you were innocent. This was just the way it was. If a man suspected that his wife was pregnant with a mother, by another man, when she had the baby, he was fully legally able to take the baby and expose the baby. If the baby had a birth defect, you exposed the baby. There was really no rules other than you couldn't take the baby's life yourself. This was accepted. This was self-evident. But Christians from the very beginning, disagreed with this. They condemned exposure and condemned infanticide, and they would eventually go out into the edges of the forest where the children were left, and they would bring them into their own homes. They would adopt them, rescuing them from certain death. They did this because they began to understand what it meant to be made in the image of God. And when they began to understand the law of Christ, we are to love others as we have been loved. The action of, of this ancient church reminds me of our own adoption into the kingdom of God. You and I, we too have been like little babies, having no clue what was going on. While we were still sinners, Christ gave his life for us. Before our conscience was informed, he rescued us from certain death. I'm really grateful for that this morning. As Christianity began to take hold and began to make inroads into the Roman Empire, the empire's conscience began to be affected by the teaching of Christianity. And questions began to emerge about this accepted practice of infanticide. 
In the year 318, after embracing uh, Christianity, after coming to Christ and, and embracing Christianity, Emperor Constantine declared infanticide a crime. Why? Why after all these years? Because suddenly it became a conscience issue. Why did it become a conscience issue? Because the teachings of Jesus and the unity of the church around the teachings of Jesus. 56 years later, in 374, Emperor Valentina made exposure, just even just setting your baby somewhere to die, a capital offense. You could lose your life if your baby lost its life because of your neglect. That sounds crazy to us, doesn't it? It sounds crazy to us that we would, that, that, that human beings could splice their conscience in such a way that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not killing the baby with my own hands, but I am going to put them somewhere where they cannot survive. There's no way the child can survive. But that's how I'm going to splice my conscience. That's how I'm going to live with myself. What is in your life this morning? What is in my life? This is the question I've been having to ask myself. Where am I segregating my conscience to the extent that even though if I get clarity about the decisions I make, if you get clarity about the decisions you make, you may discover that you're, you're quibbling about details, that if you just ask God, what are you saying to me about this? What are you saying to me about this? He might just inform you that the decisions you're making today, the decisions I'm making today, may be because our conscience has not been fully informed yet. That's always a scary part about decision-making and choosing, is it not? Do I have all the information? Is the Holy Spirit, am I open to the Holy Spirit to just simply inform me of everything I need to know? It, when we begin, begin to have an informed conscience that is informed by the Holy Spirit that says to us, this is right, this is wrong, dig into this because I think you might change your mind. When the law of Christ informs an individual or a village, or a city, or a nation's conscience, things will change. Things will change. But I, I'm a firm believer that the local church can be the place, must be the place, where change happens first. Because you and I, if we follow Jesus, we are informed by his spirit, and his spirit wants us to be the people of the Jesus way that look out for the good of the other, that look out for those around us. And if you look around, if you raise your awareness, you'll see that there has been uh, so much change even in our nation because of this very, uh, this very dynamic, this, this same dynamic that Jesus calls the, the, uh, the law of Christ. Jesus' single new covenant command was so powerful it was so ahead of its time. Nobody had ever said this kind of thing before. It was so modeled and obvious in the crucifixion and in the resurrection that it supersedes all generations and all cultures. It sits at the epicenter of the kingdom of God, values. It will never go out of date. It doesn't have a shelf life. We are forever and ever, every generation, to do for others what God through Christ has done for us. This is the kind of ethic and the kind of morality that has and will continue to inform our collective conscience. It'll give us influence in the world to inform the conscience of people who aren't here this morning, who aren't in any church, and who drive on by and say, I don't have time for this. This is why you and I can't be divided. We can be divided on our opinions about certain things. But we must not be divided about the law of Christ. We have to be solid about the law of Christ. Candidates come and go. 
Political seasons and platforms and parties, they come and go. So it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to be one as Jesus prayed we would be one in spite of political differences. And that leads us to the, next, to the next part of our template, and that's this. The law of Christ informs our conscience, and to an informed conscience, we are to incorporate knowledge and wisdom. You and I live in this modern era. So what does it look like to live out this kingdom ethic? Well, I believe we should add to our informed conscience the knowledge of science, the knowledge of psychology, and the wisdom that comes from understanding how our world works and understanding how we're made. All of it, all of it works together. Another way of thinking about this is if somebody asks you where babies come from, your answer to the question is determined by the age of the person asking. When a four-year-old asks you, well, don't lie, don't lie to them, but give them an answer that accommodates their capacity to understand. If a 15-year-old comes and asks you, you should just say, we should already know that. But this is how God accommodates our capacity. As we accumulate knowledge, and this is seen in history, as we accumulate knowledge, as we gain wisdom through experience, our capacity increases and our knowledge of how the world works does as well. So here's the deal. Knowledge and wisdom combined with an informed conscience should be, and I would contend must be used to determine the policy, the platform, the legislation we're going to support. And this is where disagreements arise within the Christian community. Why is that? Because as Rufus Miles said back in the 40s, he said, where you stand depends on where you sit. Where you sit is your cultural context. Where you live, who you're related to, how much money you have, your cultural context determines your perspective on life. It determines what you see, what you experience, how you see it, and how you interpret it. This is true for all of us. This is how we process things. This is why most of us don't see any conflict between faith and politics. None at all. You are loving this series this morning because of the people that you know that need to hear it. Is that right? But we're good. We're good, right? We need to put our faith first and our politics second. And some of us might say, well, that's why I'm a Republican. Because when I put my faith first, clearly the Republican Party is on the right. And I got my faith first. That's why I'm a Democrat. We have these competing voices. Our political views are simply not shaped in a vacuum. They're not. Views and values are shaped by a variety of things, and most of those things we have not had control over. Like, as a child, where we live. Your parents made that decision. You likely did not make that decision. How you were raised, where you were educated. You're a religious affiliation. I mean, if you would ask 10 people around you, you'd probably get different, 10 different answers. Some of us grew up in Assembly of God. Some of us have Brethren background. Some of us have Amish background, Mennonite, Methodist, Vineyard, Catholic. We have Lutherans. And we have non-denominationals. Our view and values are shaped by what we've been told, what we've seen, what we've experienced, what we've seen others experience. And again, where you stand depends on where you sit. When you and I recognize this, it empowers us to open our minds and our hands, quite frankly, to each other with humility and grace as we accommodate each other's capacity. I bet you've been in conversations where you left going, I wonder where that came from. Your positions depends on where you stand. I mean, where you stand depends on where you sit. So putting it all together, the law of Christ plus informed conscience plus knowledge and wisdom equals policy, platform, and legislation. So with that information, what do we do? 
What do we do? How do we move forward? Well, the way forward, I believe, is three ways. We listen, first of all. First of all, we listen. Listen to people who don't experience the world the way you do. Listen to those who have opposing viewpoints. Give consideration to their perspective. Listen to an atheist if you're a Christian. Listen to an old person if you're a young person. Listen to someone who grew up in a black community instead of a white community. Someone that is straight, someone that is gay, someone that is single, someone that is married. Listen to people, give an ear. And it doesn't mean you have to swallow what they say, hook, line, and sinker. It simply means you're giving consideration. You're trying to understand. Number two, learn, be curious. If you, if you walk into a situation, uh, there was a time in my life where I would have been this way. I'd be like, oh, I don't want to have that conversation. I'm, I'm different about that now. Life experience has given me some skills that I didn't used to have. But now it's such a treasure for someone to say, here's my view, and for me to ask questions and get curious about that. I love this phrase, uh, pay attention uh, to the frontiers of your ignorance. <laughs> pay attention to those places that you've never gone, you've never considered. You're ignorant about those places. Pay attention to that and learn from others about the things you don't yet know. Be a student. Be a student. This is a good word for us in this season. Be a student, not just a critic. Otherwise, we're going to discount everything that doesn't perfectly fit into our flawed worldview. We need to be better than that. Last thing, remember that you are under the law of Christ. So we're going to prioritize love. We're going to prioritize love. I don't know uh, how many times uh, I have, and you have too, you've had these experiences where differences emerge between people and we burn those relational bridges. And so many times, especially when it comes to our families, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? So just prepare yourself. You get together with family and you, you need to prioritize relationship over political views. Because the you beside you, if you look around, the people beside you, in front of you, behind you, are way more precious to God than your potentially flawed political view. Listen, learn, and love. And by the way, it's a good thing that Jesus didn't pay any attention to guilt by association. So if you think, you know, well, I could never talk to that person. What if someone saw me with that person? What kind of perspective would they have about me? Well, Jesus sat with Pharisees and fishermen and prostitutes and those caught in adultery and the little children. He showed value to all of them. He listened and he loved people, even those that despitefully used him. Would you stand with me? To this, some might say, that's really naive, Gene. That's really naive. But remember, there was a time, once upon a time, there were a handful of Jesus followers crushed between the empire and the temple. They weren't safe in the empire. They weren't safe in the temple. And yet they gave to Caesar what was Caesar's. They gave to God their lives, though. And today, if you look around, that Roman Empire is no more. The temple is no more. And the greatest Caesars are simply a footnote in the story of the rabbi from Galilee. See, kingdoms come and go. So important for us to remember this. Kingdoms come and go, empires rise and fall. Jesus said, amid all of that action, all of the governments being demolished, uh, empires rising and falling, Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not destroy it. And here we are. It's still the way forward. My responsibility and your responsibility is to show the world around us what it looks like to disagree politically, to love unconditionally, and to pray for unity. Some of us, 
still haven't given up. Some of us still believe that the local church is the hope of the world. And guess what? In four years, we're gonna have another election. In four years, this thing starts again or comes around again. But right now, God is with us. And God is with us throughout eternity. He's gonna be here in four years. God will be with us still then. So keep perspective. Choose carefully. Be informed in your decision making. And listen, learn, and love. And don't miss next weekend for the final episode of Talking Points as Tyler Hartford closes out the series. Let me pray for us. God, we come to you at the close of this talk of uh, hopefully getting some insight and direction again this morning for how then do we live in this world that is filled with division, filled with name calling and the shadow figures of uh, so many politicians trying to persuade us to make decisions, God. We need you to choose well, to make our decisions informed. Let them be informed by the law of Christ. As we step into the polling sites, may we bring your presence. May we have clarity of mind. I speak against confusion. I don't believe confusion or chaos is the work of the Holy Spirit. I do believe it is the work of our enemy. And so I pray for clarity for anyone who is in the sound of my voice today, that they would have clarity about their next step their personal next step, and also about how they will choose going forward. Father, you know exactly what we need today. You know exactly what we'll need tomorrow to face the day ahead. And so we lean into you even now and believe that you will give us exactly what it is that we need. We pray for those that are in governing, uh, that are governing authorities over us. We pray for peace, not just in their lives, but in this country. God, thank you that despite the outcome, you are with us and you will be with us. We're grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.